Let's open our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 21. We're going to, can you bring the lights up a little bit, James, so we can have lights for our study tonight? And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 21. And uh, we're going to finish the book of 2 Chronicles tonight. Really, we really are. So let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we honor you and thank you for the opportunity to just receive from your word. Lord, we know that you have given to us the full counsel of God's word, old and new. Every chapter, every verse is for our edification. Lord, there are so many treasures of wisdom that you have filled the pages of this wonderful letter to us with. And so we just desire to receive from you tonight by your Holy Spirit. Meet us in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are uh, studying, of course, about the southern kingdom, and uh, that's Judah, and the kings. And uh, we just finished with Manasseh. Manasseh was the worst king of all. You look at all the kings that Israel had, Manasseh was the worst king, bar none. Now, having said that, I mean, you have to kind of categorize his whole reign, and you, you have to be honest and say that's the way it was. I mean, he was really the despicable one. Now, having said that, it wouldn't be fair to leave it on that note, now would it? Because we know something about Manasseh that's really important. And that is that Manasseh, he reached a point in his life where he was at the lowest of the low of the lowest point that a man can get. I mean, you, you would go, you say, well, he was at this pinnacle. He was the king of Judah. I mean, he was the king, right? How low can you go? Well, we know how low he, he went because his heart was not for the Lord. It was completely uh, against the Lord. He was going after all of these gods of permissiveness, that's really what it was. You know, you talk about these foreign gods, really what it, you, there are no, no gods at all. What they are, are gods of permissiveness. And the, the, the sexual nature of those so-called gods was obvious. He was going after the whole thing. Uh, and, and so what we saw in Manasseh's life was this complete lack of faith that he had. And going after all of this, the results were such that you could just see in his life, here he's the king, right? The nation gets weaker. He gets weaker. And it continues to get worse to a point where he insulted the Lord, really. He, he just really just uh, uh, flamed against the Lord, killed the prophet Isaiah. And so what happened was, as he started to get lower, the king of Assyria came had him arrested, a hook in his nose, and dragged to Babylon where he was put into a dungeon. I mean, dark, cold, bread and water. I mean, you know, he's just down, 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 down. And he is at the lowest point in his life. And it was there that Manasseh cried out to God, beseech the Lord. He called out with his heart, oh God. You see, and now there is a turning point you know, he went from this all the way down to the lowest point, but there he turned to the Lord. And truly, the scripture says, with humility, he, he cried out to God, oh God, I beseech you, I entreat you, I have been so wrong. And, and there you get really a, a good example of what to do. You know, if you, if you ever, or anyone you know, ever gets to that point where they have just so turned their back on God and so despised God that their life got to that bottom point, the answer is found in, in Manasseh's prayer. He cried, oh God. And it was so authentic, so real. It wasn't, it wasn't just the, because he was in trouble, because he realized something. And you know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced that here Hezekiah's influence Remember Hezekiah, that was his dad. His father was a man of God, a man of faith, a man who trusted the Lord, a man who brought revival. And I have to believe if there wasn't something in Manasseh that remembered it, if there was something in Manasseh's mind. You know what the Scripture says? Raise up 
a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I think, the, you know, we can raise our children in, in, the, in the fear of the Lord and bring them up, you know, in, in godliness. And at some point, they may, they may even turn their back on the Lord. They may walk away from the Lord. But you know what I'm convinced? I'm convinced that there's a seed, so there's something there that they know of the Lord. And I'm convinced that if they could see our lives and if we could be an example of something authentic and sincere, I'm convinced that there would be something in their heart that would realize, you know what I need? I need God in my life. And then they would turn around, and I can just tell you story after story of, of kids who, you know, who got kind of full of themselves. Maybe that's the best way to say it. They got a little full, well, a lot full of themselves and had to go out there and learn for themselves just how terrible this world really is. And then they go out there, and then they hit the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, and there is something in their heart that remembers there is a God in heaven. And what I need right now is revival. And they turn around. And there are pastors today, I mean, godly guys teaching the Word of God, and they would all who've been through that would give their own testimony and say, you know what, God is so good that when you call out to him, he is faithful and just. He is a merciful God. He is gracious. His mercies are new every morning. Isn't that something you've got to love about the Lord? I mean, you know, people turning their back, raising their fist, and yet what does God do? He forgives. He restores the compassion of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord, Man, I tell you what, it just makes you want to love the Lord more when you see his heart. And you see Manasseh, because he restored him back. And that, at the end of his life, there was some revival in Manasseh's life. You look at the whole of his life, it's not fair unless you tell about his revival at the end. Amen? All right, then we come to verse 21. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years. That's it, two years. That's all they could take of him. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, uh, as Manasseh his father had done. And Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made, and he served them. So now do you remember something? Uh, let's remember a little bit about Manasseh. Remember that Manasseh... Uh, at one point, when he came back from his revival, he took those carved images and he threw them out. He just did them, you know, and this is part of revival, right? Throwing all that old, that wrong junk out of your life. He threw it out, but Ammon knew where it was, I guess, because, well, we know where it was. It was in the Valley of Hinnom. He went and got it and brought it back in, and this is kind of the sad thing. So, Verse 23, moreover, he did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had done, but Ammon multiplied guilt. Finally, his servants conspired against him and put him to death in his own house. But the people of the land killed the conspirators, killed all the conspirators against King Ammon, and the people of the land made Josiah, his son, king in his place. That's it. That's the whole account of Ammon. Just a few verses, he wasn't a good guy at all. Chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Now, Josiah is one of those guys like Hezekiah. I mean, he's just loved. And you got to just see, verse 2, it just should cause you to breathe a wonderful breath of refreshing. He did right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of his father David, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Now, did he make mistakes? Sure he did. But the theme of his life was this. He didn't turn to the right or to the left. He didn't go after other gods. That is for sure. And you got to love Josiah. His name means, by the way, God heals. And in many ways, you can see it lived out in his life. For verse 3, in the eighth year of his reign, so he's 16 years old, and remember when, when uh, a king would be very young, they would typically put in a regent. 
someone to help him to reign while he's older. But here he is 16 years old, and he's still in his youth. And it tells us here in verse 3 that he began to seek the God of his father David. He had heard of the fame of the Lord, no doubt. He had heard about the relationship. David was famous. You can be sure of that and was well known. And so all the stories of David, no doubt, Josiah heard. And when Josiah was 16 years old, he decided, he took it upon himself that he's going to know, I love this, he's going to seek the God of his father David. And so how did he do that? We don't exactly know. But we know that he did it, that he did something to seek after the Lord as David had sought after the Lord. You know, there are times in our lives that turn on a decision. We could call them maybe hinge points. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, we grow, we grow, we grow bit by bit. That's wonderful. But don't you think that there are monumental decisions, key points in your life, key decisions that a person makes. And it's important to understand that we turn on our decisions. Our life, of course, is a reflection of our decisions. And, and if you've ever had a time when you and just your alone relationship, your own private relationship to the Lord, if you've ever had that encounter with God where you've just so desired God in the private heart, the soul crying out to God, that is a decision that is life-changing. And I, I, I'm thinking about my own life, and uh, I remember when I was in junior high school, and uh, just a young guy, and I don't know all that was going on in my life, I just know that I decided to go for this long walk where no one would hear me. We lived out in the country, and so I went for this walk and I mean, I walked a long way, and I got out there, and I started yelling <laughs> to the Lord. And I'm just yelling at the top of my lungs, you know, and I'm calling out to the Lord, and I, I want the Lord to know. I guess he was hard of hearing. I thought, I don't know. I'm just yelling, right? And I'm just yelling out to the Lord. I want him to know that I need him in my life. And I had asked the Lord into my life when I was 11 but there was, some, there was some deep desire that I had in my life. Somehow I just wanted to yell out to him. Oh, God, I just need you in my life. And, 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 and I began to realize later that was a key point for me. There, that was a key point. Then later, you know, the years kind of rolled on, and I, I got kind of lukewarm in my life and uh, went to college, uh, joined a fraternity, started going to the parties that the fraternity was putting on, and a lot of beer was around at the time. I didn't drink a whole lot, but it was around all the time. There was drugs and, uh, and parties every weekend, and my soul was dying. Have you ever had this experience? My soul was dying, and uh, I will never forget a day because the night before, uh, one of my friends had gotten so drunk that he was running his head into the wall. And so I, I held him in my arms half the night till I knew that he was over it. And then I got up the next morning. Somehow the, I just woke up early the next morning and I started walking, kind of just walking through this fraternity. I could smell the beer. There was beer bottles everywhere. It just reeked of party. And I remember just walking around and something in my soul, something going on in my soul. And I just knew this isn't right. And I stepped outside. I will never forget. I stepped outside on the front porch. It's a beautiful, sunny morning. And a fresh wind was blowing in my face. And I felt the Lord was just calling out to me. I missed you. And I decided it on the spot. It was a Sunday morning. Walked back to my room, got my Bible, and I walked out. And I got in my car. And I said, God, take me to a church. Help me find a church, God. Found a church. Sat down. 
And they started singing, and I started crying. Because I realized I was empty. I needed God. And that was the beginning, another fresh beginning in the Lord. Left the fraternity. I was president of the fraternity. <laughs> Forgot to mention that small detail. <laughs> and I decided I'm going to start over. You know what? I love that about the Lord. Don't you? Fresh beginnings. Starting over. And you've got to love someone like Josiah, who in his 16th year, he heard something about David. What do you think he heard about David? David loved the Lord. And not only that, I'm convinced they had the Psalms. Of course they had the Psalms. And they had the same Psalms that we had. And they would read, no doubt, Josiah read Psalms 23, Psalms 27, Psalm 30, Psalm 51, Psalm 139. No doubt, he, he's, he's he's been reading these. I, I want that. I want that same relationship. And I love verse 3 because it speaks in his youth. In his youth, man, he's calling out to the Lord. And he began to seek God. And then in the 12th year, now he's got, you see, he's got some power. He's 20 years old now. And he's going to do something about it now. He's the king. And so in his 12th year, he began to purge. <laughs> I love that word, purge. Isn't that like a good cleansing word? He purged Judah and Jerusalem of the high places and the, of the Asherim and the carved images and the molten images, and they tore down the altars of the Baals in his presence. In other words, he says, I want to see with my own eyes. Take them down. And he tore down the incense altars that were high above them, and, and he chopped them down. And also the Asherim, all these images of sexual things, Carved images, molten images, I love this part here. It says, he broke into pieces and he ground them into powder. <laughs> no, you're not going to remake these things. I mean, he ground them into powder. No one's going to reuse these anymore. And he scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Then he burned the bones I mean, now you've got to see Josiah here. He burned the bones of the priests of those altars. He said, show me, the, show me the bones of those priests. Dig them up and burn them. Whew. I mean, you, now, see, we just read the words on the page, but you've got to sense Josiah's heart. Don't you, don't you just kind of see Josiah's command there? Show me those, uh, show me those priests. B dig them up. Burn them. Oh, my goodness. You know, the, re the command of revival that he's bringing here it is something else. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and he purged Judah and Jerusalem. And then in the cities, now he's going north. He's going outside of Judah, way up into the north. Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon. Hey, he's going up all the way to Natali and in their surrounding ruins. And he tore down the altars. There even, he beat down the ashram, carved images into powder, chopped down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel, and he returned to Jerusalem. You know, uh, 2 Kings gives us a little more detail. It's interesting. There was prophecy of Jeremiah that was given 300 years before this where Josiah was named by name. Interesting. In the northern kingdom there, you remember that in the north, uh, they had set up these golden calves because the king didn't want them going to Jerusalem to worship. So he made this kind of quasi-religion with these golden calves. And so uh, one of the prophets from the south came up and actually stood over one of these golden altars, this calf, and actually declared a prophecy against it. It's really quite fascinating. This is actually found in 1 Kings 13. He cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, and he said, O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, behold a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, 
And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. Isn't that interesting? Names him by name. Fascinating. And he shall give a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. The prophecy of Josiah was fulfilled with his zeal after the Lord. I don't know about you. I think it's fascinating. Now back to 2 Chronicles 34, verse 8. Now in the 18th year, all right, now he's 26 years old, 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent uh, Shaphan, or Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, an official of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. And they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, and delivered the money that was brought into the house of God. They had uh, collected money throughout the territories, which the Levites, the doorkeepers, had collected uh, from Manasseh, Ephraim, from all the remnant of Israel. I mean, they're collecting from everywhere. From all Judah, Benjamin, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So they gave this money into the hands of the workmen who had the oversight over the house of the Lord. And the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord used it to restore and repair the house. Then, in turn, gave it to the carpenters and to the builders to buy quarried stone and timber for couplings and to make beams for the houses which the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. That's a sad thing. And the men did the work faithfully with four men over them to supervise. List their names, Jahath, Obadiah, and the Levites of the sons of Merari, and Zechariah, and Meshulam of the sons of the Kohathites, and the Levites, all who were skillful with musical instruments. These were making sure that it was all done according to the word of the Lord, no doubt. There also, they were also over the burden bearers, supervised all the workmen from job to job, some of the Levites were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. Now, interesting thing. Verse 14, when they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law, the law of the Lord, which was given by Moses. Now, this is fascinating. They didn't have even Deuteronomy to read. And Hilkiah responded and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And so Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Now, Shaphan brought the book to the king and reported further word to the king, saying, Everything that was entrusted to your servants they are doing, and they have emptied out the money which was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of the supervisors and the workmen. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, and one more thing, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. Now here's the scene you got to see. So he's saying, uh, all that you asked is done. Uh, you know, we're doing, everything is going along very well. You asked for things to be done. No worries, it's all being done. Oh, one more thing to tell you. The hill, they found uh, the book. And so the king, no doubt, wanted it read. And so he began to read it to him. It came about then, verse 19, when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Here's why. As he's listening, no doubt, to Deuteronomy, he's just listening to that. Now, you've got to read Deuteronomy. Sit down sometime and just read it. It is a powerful book. It is the messages of Moses, which he gave to Israel just before they entered into that land of Israel, the land of promise. Just before they entered in, God wanted them to hear his heart. And so Deuteronomy is that message, those messages from Moses, or from God. And so you can just imagine, there's Josiah listening to Deuteronomy. And when they read through several of the chapters, you can just see uh, Josiah's heart just pick up. Did I read that right? 
now I'm beginning to understand something. You can just see it coming together, just clicking for him as he understands. Now I know the problem. Now I know what is wrong with our nation and how we got to where we are today. So the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Abdon the son of Micah and Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah the king's servant saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and ask those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord, to do according to all that's written in this book. Can we turn to Deuteronomy? I think it would be so good for us just to read it ourselves. So let's just read the whole book of Deuteronomy. Okay, we don't have time for the whole book. So what we're going to do, I want to just highlight a few verses that I think you can just imagine now Josiah listening as these words come to his ears and the quickening of his heart as it begins to make sense to him. How about Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Hey, make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Teach these things to all of your children. Now, going down to verse 15. So watch yourselves carefully, since you did not see any form of the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire. In other words, it's God himself. Lest you act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female. Now, you can imagine Josiah. And he's sitting there thinking, Asherim, that's nothing but female, you know, statues. Baal, that's nothing but male statues. This is found in the book. He warned us. He told us not to do that. Now look at this. Verse 19. And beware lest you lift up your eyes to heaven and then you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. And then he realized that's what we've been doing. All this worship of the stars and astrology and all that stuff. We've been doing this very thing. Oh, no. Verse 23. So watch yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he has made with you, and make for yourselves a graven, graven image in the form of anything against the Lord your God, which he has commanded you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. Jump to verse six, 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you shall surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but you will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. Now, at this moment that Josiah is hearing this, the northern kingdom of Israel, they had already been deported. Assyria had already come, taken them and deported them to uh, who knows where. And you will be scattered among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number among the nations where the Lord shall drive you. But verse 29, but from there, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. And there's the hope. If we turn this thing around, God will have mercy again. So back to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. So he sends word to a prophet saying, Seek the Lord for us. What does the Lord want us to do? Verse 22. So Hilkiah and those whom the Lord had told went to Huldah, the prophetess. He said, who did he go to? Huldah. 
the prophetess. And then in case you're wondering which holda, he tells us actually which holda it was, because apparently there must have been a lot of holdas in Jerusalem at the time. Because he tells us that it was Holda the prophetess who was the wife of Shalom, the son of Tohath, the son of Hazra, the keeper of the wardrobe. I'm glad we understand that because we might have got confused. Now, she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter. Uh, Jerusalem is divided in quarters even today, interesting. And they spoke to her regarding this. And so this is what she said. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord. Behold, I am bringing evil on this place. And on its inhabitants, even all the curses which are written in the book, which they have read in the presence of the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me, and they have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on that place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire the Lord, thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender, love this verse, underlined in my Bible, because your heart is tender and you humbled yourself before God, when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants and because you humbled yourself before me and you tore your clothes and you wept before me, I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. I love that. I truly have heard you. Why did God hear him? Because Josiah heard God. I love that. Man, if you will hear God, if you will listen, God will listen to you. Isn't that a great word? If you will hear the words of the Lord, if you will long for the words of the Lord, he will hear you. The prayers of a righteous man, the scripture says, availeth much. Isn't that an encouragement? The prayers of a righteous man or woman availeth are very effective. If you hear God, he will hear you. I just think it's a wonderful thing. Verse 28, Behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace so your eyes shall not see the evil which I will bring on this place and audience inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. So then the king sent, and he gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and all the people, from the greatest to the least. And he read in their hearing, I love this part, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. This is the scene. After he gets this word of the Lord, he calls everybody together. See, here's what I love about Hezekiah, I mean about Josiah. Remember there was something kind of similar that the Lord said to Hezekiah? Hezekiah was told of the Lord, because you have honored the Lord, yes, there will be great troubles, but it will not come in your lifetime. Hezekiah's response was, well, as long as it's not my lifetime, no worries. Now, we would look at that and say, there's something not quite right there. If you love the next generation, if you love your children and your children's children, you're going to want to bring revival into their lives as well. Is that not true? This, Josiah did differently. He heard a similar word. Because the Lord has heard your heart, saw the humility, there will be trouble coming, but it will not come in your life. Josiah's response was, we're going to then bring, if God is merciful like that, maybe he'll be merciful more. Bring the people we are going to have the word of the Lord read to all of them. And I think this is a great thing. The guys come, their kids come, you know, and so the king stands up in front of all of them and says, guys, you're not going to believe it. We found a copy of the law. You got to hear this. In the beginning was the word. No, that's John 1. In the beginning, they didn't have that yet. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, he started, you know, because he's got the whole thing of Moses, right? And he's going to start from the very beginning. Can you imagine this? He read the whole thing to them and they stood the whole time. 
you think my sermons are long. I'm telling you, there's nothing compared to what they had to sit through. And so he did it. He read the whole thing. Verse 31, then the king stood in his place. After he read the whole thing, then the king stood in his place and he made a covenant before Jehovah to walk after Jehovah, to walk after the Lord and to keep his covenants and his testimonies and his statutes. I love this part here. With all of his heart and with all of his soul. Isn't that marvelous? To love him he made a covenant to love him with all of his heart and with all of his soul. Man, let's not just read those words. Let's just honor those words because it's the same thing that God wants for all of us. No, you know where I'm convinced Josiah got that? He got it out of Deuteronomy. And Jesus quoted Deuteronomy when they asked Jesus, what is the greatest of all commandments? I mean, if you were to look at all the commandments and answer this, which one commandment is the greatest of all commandments? You know what Jesus said, because it's a very powerful answer. He said the greatest commandment of all commandments is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. Would you like the second greatest Jesus offers? The second greatest commandment is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, on these two commandments hang the entire Old Testament. You can summarize the entire commandment of God from Genesis all the way through Malachi with those two commandments. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, you have fulfilled the law of God. Isn't that amazing? And so here, Josiah stands up before the people, and he makes a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies with all of his heart and with all of his soul to perform the words of the covenant written in this book. Moreover, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand with him. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Josiah removed all the abominations from all the lands belonging to the sons of Israel. And he made all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God throughout his lifetime. They did not turn from following the Lord God of their fathers. Isn't that a great story? Listen to that verse right there. Throughout his lifetime, they did not turn from following the Lord God of their fathers. As long as Josiah was alive, they never turned. Lord, give him a long life. Isn't this an amazing verse? And powerful for us to understand. Now, when you get to chapter 35, he's going after further revival because he's going to have now celebration. All right, we are going to just worship God by celebrating the Passover. This is reminding us of Hezekiah who brought a Passover like no Passover had been seen since the time of David. But you know what they say of Josiah? It was even greater. Listen to this account. Josiah celebrated the Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem and they slaughtered the Passover animals on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. And he also said to the Levites who taught all Israel and who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark, this is interesting, I guess somewhere along the line, they took the ark of the covenant, remember the famous ark of the covenant with the mercy seat and the gold uh, and everything, the rings and the angels, they took it apparently out of the temple. They say, well, why would they do that? Because if you remember, some of these kings were so despicable that they brought in all of these foreign gods and they stuffed them in the, in the temple. What an insult to the Lord. And so at some point, the priest said, hey, if they're going to do that, we're taking the 
Ark of the Covenant out of here. And that's what happened. So he said to the Levites, verse 3, these are the Levites who taught all Israel and who were holy to the Lord, hey, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, uh, king of Israel, built, and it will be a burden on your shoulders no longer. Now, serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. And prepare yourselves according to your father's households in divisions, according to the writing of David, king of Israel, according to the writing of his son Solomon. Moreover, stand in the holy place according to the sections of the father's households of your brethren, the lay people, and according to the Levites by division of a father's household. Now slaughter the Passover animals, sanctify yourselves, and prepare for your brethren to do according to the word of the Lord by Moses, so Josiah contributed to the lay people, those who couldn't afford it, in other words, to all who were present, flocks of lambs and kids, all for the Passover offerings, numbering 30,000 plus 3,000 bulls. Those were for peace offerings and such. These were from the king's possessions. And his officers also contributed a free will offering to the people, the priests and the Levites and Hilkiah and Zechariah and Jehiel, the officers of the house of God. They gave to the priests for the Passover offerings 2,600 from the flocks and 300 bulls. And Kenina also and Shemaiah and Nathanael, his brothers, and Hash Hashabiah and Jael and Jazubab, the officers of the Levites, they contributed to the Levites for the Passover offerings 5,000 from the flocks and 500 bulls. So the service was prepared. The priests stood at their stations and the Levites by their divisions according to the king's command. And they slaughtered the Passover animals. But remember, they're all a picture of Jesus Christ. And oh, was it something to behold when we understood how every aspect of the Passover celebration Every part of it pointed to Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, John said, who takes away the sins of the world. All of this points to how our own sin was paid for by Jesus Christ. All of it declares it. Then they removed the burnt offerings that they might be given them to the sections of the father's households of the lay people to present to the Lord. As it is written in the book of Moses, they did all of this also with the bulls. So they roasted the Passover animals on the fire according to the ordinance. They boiled the holy things in pots and kettles, pans, carried them speedily to all the lay people. And afterward, they prepared for themselves and the priests. Because the priests, the sons of Aaron, were offering the burnt offerings and the fat until night. Therefore, the Levites prepared for themselves and the priests, the son of Aaron, and the singers, the sons of Asaph, were also at their stations, according to the command of David, Asaph, Haman, Jedithan, the king's seer, the gatekeepers at each gate. They did not have to depart from their service because the Levites, their brethren, prepared for them. So all the service of the Lord was prepared on that day to celebrate the Passover and to offer burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord according to the command of the king Josiah. Now, the amazing thing is, this is revival because they hadn't been doing any of this. Thus the sons of Israel who were present celebrated the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days, it's all part together, and there had not been celebrated a Passover like it in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet, nor had any of the kings of Israel celebrated such a Passover as Josiah did with the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel who were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated. Now, I want to tell you one more thing about Josiah, and then we'll be done. And then we'll finish next week. I promise you we will. After all this, verse 20, when Josiah had set the temple in order, something happened. Necho, king of Egypt, he came up to make war at Carchemish on the Euphrates. And Josiah went out to engage him. Now, in order for Necho, king of Egypt, to engage, he's going to have to pass through the territory of Israel to do it. Now, he could have just let him pass. But he decided, Josiah decided to go out and engage him in battle. For what reason? We don't know. The Lord didn't tell him to do it. And in fact, Jeremiah, the prophet, 
warned him, don't do it. This is what happened. Nico sent messengers to him saying, what do we have to do with each other, O king of Judah? I'm not coming out against you today. I'm coming out against the house with which I am at war, and God has ordered me to hurry. Stop, for your own sake, from interfering with God who is with me. He's even appealing to God of Israel, that he may not destroy you. However, Josiah would not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to make war with him. Nor would he listen to the words of Nico that were from the mouth of God, interesting, but came to make war on the plain of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah. This is a total waste. And the archers shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So the servants took him out of the chariot, carried him in the second chariot which he had, and brought him to Jerusalem, where he died, and was buried in the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Now, can we just look at this for a moment? Because, you know, you've got to love Josiah. You've got to love his reforms. You've got to love his heart after the Lord and his, the, the desire for revival with the people. But this one mistake cost him dearly, and this was his mistake. He wanted to go out to battle. We don't know why. He wanted to get in the excitement of the battle, we presume. He wanted to, you know, get out there and, and be a leader militarily, I guess. He was a leader spiritually, but something drove him. He just wanted to get out there in the midst of it, just wanted to get a taste of battle or something like that. And he had been warned, don't do it. And Nico said to him, "Why? I don't have, uh, I, I'm not even trying to pick a fight with you. Just... Uh, go back. I, I don't want to do this. Don't, don't engage me. Go back. God doesn't want you to do it either. Go. But he won't listen. So he disguises himself. And he, I'm going to get in the thick of excitement, you know. But here's what he forgot. He forgot how important he is. How he was needed for Israel. And I look at that and I thought, you know what? There's a really good picture of something. There's a really good picture of something. How, do you know how important you are to what God is doing? Do, do you know what I'm saying by this? If you have a heart of revival, if you have a heart after the Lord, don't leave your post. God's going to use you. God's going to desire to use you wherever he's going to put you. If you get a desire for the Lord, if you have a heart after revival of the Lord, don't leave your post. Don't presume for a moment that you're not important to the purposes of the Lord. You are important to the purposes of the Lord and don't leave your post for anything. Stay where God has planted you and understand that God is going to use you. You are important to the purposes of the Lord. You know how we are? We are a people that we, we have such a, a poor view of ourselves that we often have an image uh, uh, where we say, uh, it doesn't matter. Whatever I'm doing doesn't matter. Are you kidding? It matters. You are important to what God is doing here and now. Don't leave your post. Amen? Father, we love you and thank you for the message you have given us to encourage us that we can understand how important it is to seek after your heart. And Lord, that we would be like Josiah desiring to be used of you. And Lord, what a message you've given to us that we would not leave our post, that we would not leave what you've asked us to lead. Lord, that you would use us to make a difference in this world. We are so thankful for your hand. Use us, Lord, for the purpose of change and revival in our midst. Oh, Lord, we love you and honor you and thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Let's worship the Lord as we close. God bless you guys.